Well, good morning. It's good to see you today. And uh, I want to just begin by asking you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 24. Now, as you're doing that, I'm just going to introduce things a little bit here. Um, first of all, I want to say that I did borrow, with permission, this message that I'm going to bring you this morning. Actually, I went to a Christian camp this summer. Some of us actually who are here were there as well. And I listened to this message. It kind of blew me away, and I got his permission. I changed it up a bit, and I'm using some of these ideas. Second of all, though, I want to warn you that I got a lot of information. I'm going to read from a, the Bible a lot here. And so you're going to just have to settle in. It's going to be a little longer message than usual. So uh, just get comfortable. And yes, please do open your Bibles or if you've got your cell phone, go to your Bible app. And uh, thirdly, just by way of introduction, I want to introduce you to something that we find in the biblical narrative, something that literary scholars refer to as a type scene. The Old Testament is filled with type scenes. And uh, you'll see them in the Bible from time to time. You'll recognize these. And it helps you if you do recognize them to understand the Bible message a bit better. But what is a type scene? Well, let me tell you a little bit about them. It's a series of uh, plot points that intentionally repeat. It's kind of a plot pattern that you can recognize. And uh, it's uh, for a particular audience or a particular culture. You might call it a literary formula for the people of a particular culture. Okay? Don't be put off by the technical language. We'll just start by asking, what are some type scenes that we find in our own culture today? Uh, so what are, what are the literary plot points that if we're watching TV or we're watching movies or maybe we're, watch, we're reading a novel or something, what are some of those formulaic storylines that we come into again and again? And uh, almost to the point where you can begin to predict what the movie's going to happen next. Well, there are more than you might imagine. There's a fairly predictable, uh, for example, you've got the revenge movie formula, right? And it really doesn't stray too far from this basic formula, which ends with the good guy blowing away the bad guy. Or if you watch like a murder mystery, you remember like Murder, She Wrote, you know, and it was like almost the same thing every single week, just sort of different characters and situations. And, um, or you've got maybe like the sports drama that follows these seven plot points, right? You've got the athlete, whether he's good or not, he's got a goal. And the athlete trains for that goal. Are you recognizing this at all? And then the athlete enjoys some success. Oh, but the athlete suffers a setback. Oh, no. And then the athlete becomes the underdog. And this is where you start to play the music, the eye of the tiger, okay? Dun, dun, dun. And then the athlete competes and wins. Awesome. And then the end. So, there you go. I mean, how many movies have you watched that have followed that, right? Or, um, for example, let's go with the the Roco, right? The romantic comedy. There's a formula that script writers will use with exacting precision. And once I tell you about it, it'll ruin it for you. The Roco literary formula goes like this. Boy meets girl. Boy and girl do not like each other. Boy and girl are forced to spend time together. And then boy and girl fall in love. Oh. Boy and girl encounter a conflict. There's a misunderstanding. Oh no, what's going to happen? Boy and girl are separated and sad. Boy chases girl. Speech, kiss, and of course they live H-E-A. You know, happily ever after. Okay, now let me show you how that last part goes. Now, you can imagine my disappointment when it suddenly dawned on me. The woman I love is about to be kicked out of the country. So, Margaret, marry me. Because I'd like to date you. Oh, gets me every time. reason why I've been alone all this time. I'm comfortable that way. And I think it would just be a lot easier if we forgot everything that happened and I just left. You're right. That would be easier. I 
I'm scared. <laughs> Me too. All right, that's enough of that. <laughs> Guys, you're welcome. But, but try this this week, if you will. If you, guys, if you can avoid throwing up, watch a romantic comedy and see if it doesn't follow those seven basic plot points. You can even boil the, the bo formula down to something simpler that goes like this. I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you, the end. And now I've spoiled for you every romantic comedy you'll ever watch, unless, of course, you're a guy in which they're already spoiled and you hate them. So revenge movies and sports dramas and murder mysteries and romantic comedies are just kind of a few examples in our culture of type scenes. Okay, you're locking in on that? Now, now that we kind of know what a type scene is, let's travel back in time, about you know, 4,000 years. And let's examine a typical type scene that we would find in the ancient Near Eastern culture. In Genesis chapter 24, we're going to find a well wedding type scene. It's kind of the equivalent of our romantic comedy, just a, a few less... Um, Kisses, and uh, not quite as much Sandra Bullock. So here we go. The eight plot points that you should be looking for. And it uh, goes, goes like this. Man travels far from home. Man sits by a well. Man, woman comes to the well. Ooh, water's drawn. Woman tells news of man's arrival. Man is invited for supper. Where's this going? Man and woman are betrothed. Now that didn't take long. That was quick. Man and woman consummate marriage. So with this in mind, let's just turn to Genesis chapter 24. And we're going to see where this type scene takes us. And the, the background for the story is that Abraham is old and he's getting along in years. And he sends his servant to a faraway land to find a bride for his son Isaac amongst his own, fam, kind of his own people. So we pick up the story where the servant has arrived in the foreign land. Okay, So we already got scene number one. And he's praying for God to lead him to the right woman to marry Isaac. Verse 12. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today. And show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring. Whoa. And the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Okay, that's pot point number two. Man sits by a well. What's next? Verse 14. As he's praying, may it be when, when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you've chosen for your servant, Isaac. And that's how I'll know. Now we're ready for plot point number three, where a woman comes to the well and is if on cue. We have verse 15. It says, before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. I guess just making that point real clear there. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. So far, so good. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she'd given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too. Until they've had enough. And so there we go. Plot point number four. Water is drawn. Now what do you expect next? And perhaps you're saying, well, I think that maybe, you know, the woman is going to tell news of the man's arrival. And how right you are. After the servant gives these great gifts to Rebecca, verse 28, the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. There it is. Plot point number five. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, I think he's going to be invited for supper. Bang on. Next verse, 29. Now Rebekah had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and he heard Rebekah tell what the man said to her, he was very interested. What's going on here? It's a lot of money. This guy's showering on my sister. He went out and found him standing by the camels near the spring. Come, you who are blessed by the Lord, he said. I like this guy. Why are you standing out here? I prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels and water for him and his men to wash their feet. Verse 33, then food was set before him. Okay, there we go. Plot point number six. The guy's invited for supper. As the story progresses, the servant explains that there's this supernatural answer to prayer. And Rebecca came and I know she's the one. And so the oldest brother is involved in making this deal and Rebecca gives her approval and now she's betrothed to a guy that she's never met. There we go, number seven. And she's sent away to marry her knight in shining armor. Verse 61, 
Rebecca and her attendants got ready and mounted the camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. Now, we get Isaac had come up from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate. As he looked up, Isaac saw camels approaching. Rebecca looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who's the man in the field coming to meet us? He's my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebecca. Now, I could be wrong, but I think the whole they went into the tent thing means that number eight took place. Now, if this is really a type scene in that culture, if this is a kind of a series of plot points that we're going to see repeat over and over, if this is kind of the, the romantic comedy of its day, then we might expect to see this literary formula pop up again and again. So let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 29. Now the context here is that Jacob, that's Isaac's son Jacob, is running away from his red-headed, excessively hairy, older brother Esau. Verse 1, then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the eastern peoples. There we go, plot point number one, a man is far from home. Verse 2, then he saw a well in the open country with three flocks of sheep lying near it. There we go, number two. Man sits by a well. Verse 4, Jacob asked the shepherds, My brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they replied. He said to them, Do you know Laban? Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked him, Is he well? Yes, he is, they said. And here comes his daughter Rachel with the sheep. So there we go. Number 3, woman comes to well. Verse 7, look, he said. The sun is still high. It's not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and take them back to pasture. So this is what... Jacob is saying, get out of here. Take off. The, the beautiful woman is coming, right? It would be better if you guys were somewhere else. Oh, they can't, the shepherds replied, until the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away. Then we'll water the sheep. And so, while he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over, and with great strength, the strength of love, he rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well. In other words, let's get these shepherds out of here. I don't care what it takes. I'll roll that stone away. So there we go. Number four, water is drawn. Verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. He told Rachel, I'm a relative of your father and a son of Rebecca. So she ran and told her father. Woman tells news of man's arrival. Number five, verse 13. As soon as Laban heard the news about his sister's son, Jacob, he hurried to meet him. He's like, I've, get, I've got a serious case of deja vu going on here. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him all these things. Then Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. So the man is invited into the home for lodging and for food. That's number six. And then after Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Let's cut a deal. Now Laban had two daughters. Verse 16 says, the name of the older was Leah. And the name of the younger one was Rachel. We've already met her. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. You know, he's kind of being real particular there. Your younger daughter, Rachel, you know the one named Rachel? I'll work for you for seven years for her. And you all heard that, right? You got that clear? You didn't miss that. You didn't hear him say, Leah, I'd like to marry Leah. You heard him say, he'd like to marry Rachel. Now, it's not super clear what's meant in the original Hebrew text when it says that Leah had, quote, weak eyes. It's not totally clear. Does that mean that she can't see very well? Some scholars think so. Other scholars see that he's, uh, she's being compared with the beauty of her sister, Rebecca. And so perhaps another interpretation is that she's not nearly as beautiful as Rebecca. But it doesn't really matter whether she can't see very well or whether she's not very beautiful. Uh, either way you go, she didn't look so good. Sorry, bad joke. All right, verse 19. <laughs> Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So it says that Jacob served seven years just to get Rachel. But the Bible says it seemed like just a few days because he was so in love with her. Oh, so there we go. That's plot point number eight. The man and the woman are betrothed. They cut the deal. They're ready to go. After the seven years are up, there's a little bit of a twist in the plot. 
So in verse 21, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. Oh, but I don't know about you guys, but that's not exactly how I would put it. A fairly blunt thing to say to your future father-in-law. Hey, I want to make love to her. Give her to me. Verse 22. So Laban brought together all the people of the place through a feast. And when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob made love to her. So I guess he'd been drinking too much that night. And, uh, or did, maybe the lights were out. I don't know what. But there's plot point number eight. Or is it? Verse 25. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel. Didn't I? Didn't we have a deal? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter a marriage first. Finish this daughter's bridal week, and I'll give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And so Jacob did so, the Bible says. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Verse 30, it says, Jacob made love to Rachel also. So there you go. The man and the woman consummate the marriage. Actually, the man and two women. So we're kind of getting the hang of this, right? But just because you're thinking, oh, Steve, you're still making this up. You're seeing too many patterns. We're going we're gonna to go into Exodus chapter 2. So here's another ancient Near Eastern wedding type scene that involves a well. And it's the story of Moses. Moses just killed an Egyptian. Pharaoh's ticked off. Moses runs away. It says in verse 15, when Moses heard of this, he tried to kill, or sorry, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. Moses fled and went to live in Midian, which is quite a, quite a ways away. So there's number one, man travels far from home. And it says he sat down by a well. Hmm, interesting. There's number two. Now, who wants to bet the woman is about to drop by? Anybody here want to lay some money on that? Good, I see that hand. Verse 16. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their flock. And some of the shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses stuck up for them and came to the rescue and watered their flocks. So now you've got number three and number four, water's drawn. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, Why have you come back so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, he even drew water for us, and it watered the flock. There's number five, the announcing of his arrival. And it's a fun cue. Here's number six in verse 20. And where is he, Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Oh, what's that? Number six. So are you starting to hear wedding bells? Verse 21, Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. There's plot point number seven, betrothal or engagement. Verse 22, Zipporah gave birth to a son. Now, unless it's an immaculate conception, that would assume that plot point number eight has taken place. So once again, let's take a breather. Let's just back up a little bit. I've taken so much of your time already. What have we learned so far this morning? Well, in every culture, there are type scenes, literary structures, formulas. We have them in our own society, like sports dramas and murder mysteries and revenge movies and romantic comedies. And the people in biblical times had their own type scenes. One of the most prevalent of these would be the well-wedding type scene that we find in Genesis chapter 24, 29, and Exodus chapter 2. Now, let's just make, uh, we're going to spring forward to an important story that we find in the New Testament with Jesus. But before we do that, let's just acknowledge that all these people that we've been learning about this morning all played a huge part in the story of salvation history. Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah and Rachel, Moses and Zipporah, these are all key players in God's story of his pursuit of intimacy with humanity. Okay? Now with that said, is there any interaction that Jesus had in the Gospels that reminds you of a well-wedding type scene? Can anybody help me here? The Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And here now we catch up with Jesus and he's, he's far from home and he's heading back to where, you know, he lives in the northern part of Israel. And it says that he had to go through Samaria. So, okay, we've got a man who's far from home in foreign territory. Verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And it goes on to say Jacob's well was there. Now, just a minute now. The author of the gospel here is kind of giving you a clue here. He's saying, hey, do you remember this dude named Jacob? And he, he had something to do with a well, you know? 
I just want you to remember that. I want, to, I want you to lock that in, okay? And the author doesn't want to just outright tell you what's going on. He wants to just sort of hint at it. It's so much more fun when the Holy Spirit makes those connections with the Old Testament in your mind. So verse 6, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Hmm, there we go. It was about noon. Now, if you're somebody who's steeped in ancient Near Eastern culture, right now as you're reading this, the story of John's gospel, your mind is just starting to track with that type scene. You're not intentionally doing that. In the same way as when you click play on your Blu-ray and you start to re watch a romantic comedy, you just know. If you r go home today and you uh, rent a Katherine Hagel movie tonight, it doesn't matter which one, just rent any one. And you'll get to the point in the movie where the man and the woman have met and then the man and the woman hate each other and then you know what's going to happen, right? You can predict it. You know that they're going to, you know, be forced to spend time with each other and then they're going to fall in love. And then you know that they're going to they're be mad at each other about some misunderstanding and then you know that they're going to get back together and there's going to be an uncomfortable smooch and then they're going to live happily ever after. You know this, right? And guys, we know that our wives are going to like this movie and it's going to put her in the mood and so even though we want to watch Arnold Schwarzenegger blow aliens away... We spend our Saturday night watching a romantic comedy. And ladies, if the movie doesn't play out quite in the way that you expect, right? I'm guessing there's a pretty good chance you're going to be a little ticked off. Imagine the man and the woman, you know, they meet and they hate each other and then they fall in love and then they, uh, there's a misunderstanding, you know? Are you going to enjoy the fact that then the movie just says, the end? And they never get back together? Probably not. In the same manner, the person reading in the first century who is familiar with the Old Testament just knows where this is going. A man far from home sits down by a well. What's next? Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water. There we go. Plot point number three. The story goes on to say that Jesus said to her, hey, we're in a romantic comedy. No, he didn't say that. He said, will you give me a drink? So we got plot point number four. Now, if you remember... That is exactly almost word for word what Abraham's servant said to Rebecca. It's just like a well-worn ancient pickup line. It's kind of the, the equivalent of, did it hurt when you fell out of heaven? <laughs> Have we met? You look a lot like my future wife. This is the ancient equivalent of, are your legs sore because you've been running through my dreams all night, baby? If I had a nickel for every time I saw a woman as beautiful as you, I'd have five cents. Do you have any raisins? How about a date? All right. So, sorry. I'm not kidding, though. There's a dynamic here where this is like charged romantically, okay? Everything is unfolding according to a very well-known, well-wedding type scene formula. And so perhaps we can understand then why the Samaritan says in verse 9, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Now, sometimes we've said, oh, that's because her utensils would have been unclean. I think it goes further than that. She's like, is this really appropriate for us to be having this conversation? Come on. See, this is not just about Jesus being nice to a Samaritan woman. Jesus knows the type scene, and so does the Samaritan woman. The story is about Jesus initiating a well-known marriage ritual with a Samaritan woman. Check out verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, some scholars see in this a reference to marriage. Living water being an allusion to marriage. What happened was a bride, before she was married, would go into a ritual bath called a mikvah. And it would have flowing water, ma'in ka'im it's called, or what they called living water. And Jesus may be referring to that ritual purification that takes place for brides prior to a wedding. It's kind of hard for the Samaritan woman to avoid that conclusion. Jesus is kind of treading on thin ice. Listen to the rest of the conversation. Verse 11, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to drink water. Now, I don't know, as I'm reading it, I don't know how serious she is in the conversation. I think Jesus is serious, but I'm not sure. It sounds to me like she's engaging in some playful banter. Maybe some almost flirtful conversation. Because I have a hard time believing this woman really thinks Jesus is going to give her physical water that will satisfy her physical thirst so she never has to drink anything again. See, what she's doing, I think, is just some playful banter. Jesus says, give me a drink. She says, how appropriate is us for really to have this conversation? Jesus says, well, I could give you living water, which sounds like a bit of an allusion to a wedding ritual. And she says, and it sounds to me like she's having a little bit of fun. She says, Oh, look how deep the well is. How are you going to get that living water? Jesus says, my water's so good, you're not going to have to drink any more water after you have my water. And she says, give me some of that good stuff. Then I don't have to keep coming back here to draw water all the time. Is that a serious conversation from her perspective? I think she's engaging in some playful, romantic banter. I don't think she's expecting that Jesus is going to give her her last drink that she'll ever have or need. In verse 16, the conversation takes an interesting twist. It says, Jesus told her, go, call your husband and come back. Now we're talking about, are you married? I have no husband, she replied. Now, is that all the truth? Well, that's not completely all the truth. See, I'm I'm available. I'm single. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you now have. Is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Now she's shocked. How did the stranger know this about her? And why, if he knew that, would he initiate this conversation? All of a sudden, the conversation takes it on a serious tone. She tries to change the topic. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Now, and she brings up sort of a theological conversation Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. You Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she's trying to shift the conversation off of her lifestyle choices. Verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem over there. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming and it has now come. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And so now in verse 25, the woman says, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. See, she's starting to see who Jesus is. And then Jesus declared in verse 26, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So we have plot point one, two, three, and four, ending in Jesus telling the woman, this is my true identity. I am the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Something for us to notice here is that this is the very first time that Jesus has revealed his identity to anybody. Okay? I mean, not even his disciples have heard him yet say, I am the Messiah. Jesus offers this woman A relationship with him reveals his identity. That which is the source of living water that will satisfy her soul for her whole life long and into eternity. She's been desperately thirsty trying to quench her thirst for security. Her thirst for meaning in her life. Her thirst for love. And she's been looking, as the country song says, in all the wrong places. She's been used and thrown away by five different guys, at least, in her life. She's coming to the well in the heat of the middle of the day because she's just so shamed and feels so profoundly worthless about herself. She wants to avoid all the other women in town and all of their gossip. And here, by the well, she meets this man who initiates a well-worn traditional marriage ritual and then reveals his identity to her as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Not just for the Jews, but for all people. He offers her himself. In some sense, as her husband. 
That he would be the living water that would satisfy her thirst for real love. Wow. Now the story goes on to say in verse 28, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. What do we have? Plot point number five. The woman tells of the man's arrival. Now just before that then, in verse 27, Jesus' disciples come back and they urge him, eat something. Jesus says, I've got food to eat here. I've been eating this banquet that you know nothing of. And Jesus mentions that the food that satisfies his soul is to do the work that God has sent him to earth to do. So why does the narrator include this whole food conversation in the story? What does this have to do with anything? Well, it's because eating is something that we expect. In the type scene, number six. And so we see that John the Evangelist is very intentionally writing this narrative about Jesus, drawing us into the well-wedding type scene by intentionally giving us plot points one through six. Now, let's skip to verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know this man really is the savior of the world. Now this is interesting. In John chapter 4, verse 5, Jesus journeys far from home. In chapter 6, he sits by a well. In verse, or sorry, in, in verse 6, he sits by a well. In verse 7, a Samaritan woman approaches the well, and Jesus asks her, draw out some water. In verse 28, she goes back into town to tell everyone about Jesus' arrival. In verse 34, Jesus tells the disciples about the delicious meal that he's been eating. So what about plot point number 7? Where's the betrothal? Isn't Jesus supposed to be engaged to this woman? The type scene seems to be truncated here. Imagine you're watching that romantic comedy. And as I said, the man and the woman start the movie. And they hate each other. And then they love each other. And then they hate each other. And, and there's the, then there's that musical montage where the man is walking through the rain. Right? And he's crying. And she's at home and she's drinking a, a bottle of wine by herself. Sad. And then all of a sudden, right after that musical montage, imagine, boop, the end. What? If you can imagine that, I mean, you'd be ripped off. You'd never tell anybody about this movie ever again. It was terrible. It didn't even finish. If you can imagine that, you can imagine what a person reading this story in ancient times may have felt like. Like, where's the betrothal here? The type scene has been truncated. But perhaps if we have eyes to see, there is, in fact, a betrothal. If we just look a little deeper. In the same way that the meal that Jesus ate was not physical in nature but spiritual. Could it be that the betrothal took place on a spiritual plane? When the people of the town came out to meet Jesus. The Samaritan woman and all these people that came. They placed their trust in Jesus. They became believers in Jesus. They became new creations in Christ. Perhaps the betrothal took place right there. When they were born again. See, the gospel is telling us here that Jesus longs to become the husband of people who are wandering far from God. Jesus longs to be the intimate lover of sinners like you and me. Even five-time married Samaritans who are shacking up with their boyfriend and sneaking to the well in the middle of the day, Jesus searches for them and loves them and wants them to be his bride. Do you ever feel like the Samaritan woman at the well? I know I do from time to time. Do you ever feel unworthy of God's love? You just can't forgive yourself for something you've said or something you've did. Do you feel that God could not forgive you for something? In the past few weeks, we've been talking about God's relentless pursuit of intimacy with you. And so many people, so many people are like that Samaritan woman. I've done too much. God could never love me. I remember, it's been now about 19 years, when I was married in a church in Saskatchewan. I stood at the front right about here. And the back doors of the church were opened, and I saw my bride. Oh, I was just overwhelmed with emotion. 
overwhelmed with love for her as she was dressed in white, making her way up here to the front to commit her life to being with me, to being one with me. It blew me away. How much more so does God look at you? You're his bride. You have white on. And his heart is filled with love for you. And he longs for you to see yourself through his eyes. Like the Samaritan woman, you become part of the bride of Christ because you recognize your brokenness. It's not because of you becoming a you know, wonderful person or doing all these good things to earn his love. You just reached out his hand and received his mercy. And you've taken from his hand the, the living water that satisfies your soul. So we've got plot point number seven in John's gospel. But where's the consummation? Well, I believe we've got to turn to another book of the Bible written by John the Evangelist. So let's turn to the book of Re- Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. It says in verses 6 and 7, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. Oh, we've got the consummation coming, folks. It's coming up here in verse 9. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. The Samaritan woman will be there. Will you be there? Have you reserved your seat at the wedding supper of the Lamb? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you received his forgiveness? Revelation 21 begins by saying, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Will you be there as the bride of Christ at the consummation of all things? Verse 6, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega The beginning and the end, Jesus says to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Jesus offers us, as he offered her, the water of life that will satisfy. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, the scriptures wrap up with this glorious statement. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, are you thirsty? Let the one who's thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Let everyone who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. A relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Acknowledging him as the savior of the world. As the Messiah. And if you do, you will be there at the consummation of all things. You will be part of the well-wedding type scene. You will be the bride of Christ. And you will enjoy the wedding supper of the Lamb in company with your husband and Lord Jesus forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, my prayer is that we would see with your eyes who we are. That we would embrace our identity in Christ. That we would have a supernatural experience recognizing that we are God's treasured possession. We are your bride, Lord Jesus. And melt our hearts and enable us to worship you with hearts that are full of joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we worship together. I've given you a lot to think about today. Just before I let you go, I want to give you one more thought. And Jesus kind of answered a question that I've been answering a lot, or asking a lot, which is, how come Jesus has taken so long to come back and to take us, his bride, home? Why has it been 2,000 years and counting? Well, Jesus told us a parable that really answers that question. He talks about in Matthew 22, he tells a parable of a wedding banquet. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Of course, he's talking about his father, Preparing a wedding banquet for him, his bride, and he. And it talks about how the father sent out 
wedding invitations to all these different people, all these rich and famous people, and they re rejected the invitation. They didn't want to come. It talks about how, um, you know, they gave excuses even. Oh, I just married. I just bought some cattle. I just bought some land. I cannot come. I cannot come. I cannot come. Some of you sang that when you were, when you were a kid. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. And then it goes on to say that the, the father said to the servant, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go into the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. The lame, the broken, those whose lives are in bad shape. Go. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Do you see that? This is why Jesus hasn't returned yet, because there are still seats available at the wedding banquet. Your neighbor, your co-worker, your brother, your sister, people who are wandering like the Samaritan woman, far from God, those who, like us, are broken. God says, I don't want one single seat to be empty. And so I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Like the Samaritan woman, we're part of the broken and the lost who are betrothed to Jesus and we've been given the job of telling others who are broken and lost about Jesus. And it would seem according to this parable that Jesus is waiting for us to fill those seats. So this week, let's pray about those who we can tell the good news to. Let's invite people to come into the wedding supper of the Lamb. Let's fill those seats. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've taught us in your word about how you see us as a groom who just looks longingly and lovingly at his new bride. And we pray, Father, that you would open up the eyes of our hearts today, that we would see you and would see ourselves and our identity in you through your eyes. Father, the number one thing that keeps me out of your holy of holies is that I don't accept your grace and love and mercy. And so I pray that you would speak to our hearts about who we are. And then, Father, I pray that you would fill us with such gratitude that we would go and we would tell the good news to people here at home and abroad so that we might hasten the wedding banquet that we look forward to one day. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. We'll see you next week. God bless you.